This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and uh, welcome to another edition of Living Legend Lawyers. This is a program uh, by, aired by Think Tech in conjunction and in collaboration with the Hawaii State Bar Association. My name is Howard Luke. I am the current president of the Hawaii State Bar Association and I am so honored this afternoon to have as my guest Mr. Lowell Chun Hoon. Uh, Mr. Chun Hoon has uh, been practicing law for over 40 years now. He has uh, really distinguished himself in the areas in particular of uh, labor and employment law and also in workers' compensation law, but that doesn't tell the whole story. His entire career and even before he became a lawyer has been devoted to helping the underserved and the underprivileged in our communities. Um, he has devoted enormous amounts of time, all pro bono or for no compensation, on behalf of so many people, those who have been suffering by uh, uh, an account of human trafficking, on torture, and uh, several different forms of abuses of uh, human dignity. So I'm happy to have here Mr. Chun Hoon this afternoon. Uh, I will also say that uh, Lowell, if I may call you that, you are one of the most popular and trusted attorneys in, in our state. I, I think everyone would agree with me on that. Uh, briefly, uh, you know, I could go on the entire half an hour about your background, but I just want to say that uh, congratulations. You are consistently rated as one of Hawaii's best lawyers, one of America's best lawyers, and have been lawyer of the year in these areas of employment law and labor law as, and workers' compensation. So welcome aboard. Thank you very okay. much, Howard. All right. Now, we all, um, I would also like to add one more thing before we really get started in your background and so forth. Um, uh, you have been involved with Legal Aid Society. You're on the Board of Directors and the Hawaii Immigrant Justice Center. These are areas of your uh, non-practice that I'm going to be asking you about. And, um, but first, I'd like to ask you a little bit of your background. Why don't you just take it away? Okay, well, uh, you know, I went to Palama Preschool, which is probably my primary okay. street credentials. <laughs> then I spent 13 years at Punahou. After Punahou went to So you lost all your credentials there, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I lost cred whatever credibility I had as a member right. of the proletariat. Yeah. But, uh, um, you know, I graduated from Yale in 1971, went to the UCLA Asian American Studies Center, where I edited a small publication called the Amerasia Journal that continues until this day. While you were an undergraduate? No, no. Well, it started when I was yeah. an undergraduate at Yale, but uh, UCLA gave the mm -hmm. publication permanent funding, so it now exists and continues at the UCLA mm -hmm. Asian American Studies Center. Uh, along the way, I picked up a master's in American history at UCLA in 1974, went to law school at UC Berkeley in 1977, and came back to Hawaii then. Okay, and um, even before you graduated from law school, you were working for a law firm, a very famous law firm. I think you were externing or interning at Boslog and Simons, is that correct? Yes, I, 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 I spent a summer there and then after I graduated from law school, I, I worked for uh, the same firm. Okay, you were an associate there. Right. All right. Tell us about the, the two names, Harriet Boslog and of course Meyer Simons. Uh, about their backgrounds. I know this is supposed to be about you. You're the living legend lawyers, but they are true legends uh, in the past. Well, that's absolutely correct, Howard. Um, Cy and Harriet were founding members of the National Lawyers Guild, but in addition to that, they came to Hawaii when none of the other 400 members of the Hawaii Bar would represent the ILWU during McCarthyism. And so Cy and Harriet both had a great deal to do with resisting uh, charges against the union and its members of engaging in unlawful assembly. And, in, uh, um, and they were prosecuted under riot statutes. Um, this coincided with the upswing of the ILWU and the organizing of the sugar plantations at the end of World War II. And Cy and Harriet were also forced to defend witnesses who appeared before the House of Un-American Activities Committee when the committee came from Washington, D.C. to investigate allegations of communism amongst uh, Hawaii's unions, and in particular the ILWU. So in the course of their representation, they invoked the Fifth Amendment for the first time in a congressional hearing 
And the when you say uh, for the first time, you mean the first time nationally? Or? The first yeah. time nationally mm -hmm. that there was a judicial recognition that the Fifth Amendment extended its protection to people testifying in congressional hearings. Wow. And then um, you told me a little something about uh, Meyer Simons and, uh, and some of the other people you work with, but um, I believe that. Uh, you know, was Meyer Simons, uh, in, was he involved in, in the war effort or at all? He, he or, was. Originally, Sai was a bankruptcy lawyer from Vallejo, California, but he became an enforcement attorney for um, some branch of the government, and the name escapes me right now. But with the War Price Administration, I think if, if businesses engaged in profiteering during the war, the federal government would bring actions against him, and that's what Sai did. Yeah, and then Harriet Boslog, uh, she is, uh, in some minds, even more prominent than Mr. Simons. Uh, she had, I believe that she had a case that went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. That, that's correct. She essentially gave a, a speech, I think, on the Big Island, in which she doubted whether communists could receive a fair trial in Hawaii, and she was disbarred for that by the Bar Association at the time. And it wasn't until her case made its way to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1954 that her disbarment was reversed by a vote of five to four. At the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Yeah. Supreme Court. Oh, interesting. And among the many interesting things about Harriet, uh, she also dated Sam King for a little while. Oh. Judge. US the judge Sam District King. Judge yeah. Sam King. Okay. Yeah. Before you graduated from law school, I, I'm reading a little bit about your background. Uh, you had, I believe it was an externship with uh, Judge Robert Takasugi from the Middle District of California, United States District Court. That, that's yeah. correct. I was very fortunate to work for Judge Takasugi for a semester, my uh, first semester of third year of law school in Los Angeles, California. And uh, Judge Takasugi had been a distinguished criminal defense attorney um, in East Los Angeles and um, was eventually appointed to the federal bench. So. Right. Yeah, he had, uh, I, I heard of him before probably even uh, before I got to know you. I mean, uh, his, he was um, appointed a federal judge, and uh, eventually, I think this is long after he had graduated from, high, uh, from uh, law school, he went on to do other things that uh, gained national prominence. I think he presided over the Larry Flint trial or proceedings. Also, um, I, I think it was, uh, he had presided over some of the prosecution of individuals who were involved or in matters related to what happened on September 11, 2001, is that correct? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I believe yeah. that's correct. Yeah. yeah. So, and uh, but you had an inside, sort of a ringside seat to what was happening, and there was really uh, prominent well, cases. I, well, I think one of the most notable things for me with Judge Takasugi is he would instruct the bailiff to announce his arrival by saying, "Court is now in session. The Honorable Robert M. Takasugi presiding." Will you all please remain seated? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because he didn't want to elevate himself among above everyone else. Oh, that's and I guess the most exciting case we had during my brief tenure there was ABC Television tried to enjoin the showing of the movie Billy Jack, and the judge denied the injunction, oh, is that believing right? that yeah. they could recover monetary damages if they could prove a loss at a later wow. date. Wow, that's amazing. And then he did, the, I think, the DeLorean trial at some point. Is yes. Correct. But we won't go uh, too far into that. I, I think we could talk about you know, your, his tenure on the bench, uh, but we have time and, uh, you know, to wrap up this interview. So um, it seems like a lot of, like Judge Sakasugi, other individuals were uh, involved as, their families were interned during World War II as Judge yes. Sakasugi's family. And then later on, when you, when you graduated from law school and worked for uh, uh, Boslog and Simons, it, eventually you went off to um, another firm with uh, Nakamura, Nakamura, and I don't know if I have the right uh, series, but and, um, uh, King Nakamura, Nakamura, and Takahashi, is that correct? That, that, yeah. That's right. There was, there was yeah. a point at which Harriet and Sai and the rest of us separated. Right, and yeah. And that's why you moved on to the other firm. Right. So what about James King? Uh, what a, uh, he had a pretty interesting background himself, didn't he? Right. Well, you know, Jim was, was part of the Kamaina mm -hmm. King family. 
he actually went to Georgetown and stayed with his uncle, Samuel Wilder King, in Georgetown, who was then the territorial representative for the territory of Hawaii. And Jim eventually went on to um, serve in World War II, where he was captured by the Nazis and was a prisoner of war uh, in the Voges Mountains. Um, so he lived you know, through some extraordinary hardship, uh, surviving on potato soup and the most minimal kind of nutrients. Um, and he had a little bit of history after the war. I think he returned, I've, I've read somewhere, returned to, uh, to France where, in the area where he was uh, incarcerated or? Yes, uh, that, that, yeah. that, that's right, he went back to the village um, many years later with his regiment and he was embraced as a hero. Um, the mayor of the small town kissed him on both cheeks and they had a little parade for the uh, American servicemen who had fought to defend the village. So that was, that was certainly an impressive highlight of his life and during his legal career probably the two most notable cases that he ever did was he represented um, Mr. Muller, the poly sniper, and he also did a case called Akamini versus Hawaiian Packing and Crating which is perhaps the seminal case on the presumption of coverage in our workers' compensation statute. Okay, and that's the path you followed in your legal career, you know, doing workers' comp on behalf of the claimants, is that correct? That, that's yeah. right. Yeah. There are two Nakamuras. One was Hideki, of course, you know, a very, very wonderful man. I, I did get to meet him personally, and, and you know, he didn't know who I was, uh, but he was so cordial, and I was so surprised what a, a gentleman he was. The other, of course, being uh, Edward or Eddie Nakamura, uh, who was uh, probably the preeminent labor lawyer for many years and then eventually was uh, appointed to the Hawaii State Supreme Court as an associate justice, where, now I'm, this is my endorsement of you know, I, reading his opinions, in, mostly in criminal cases, but also in civil cases. I, I had the impression that he could sit in any court of the land. He's a great scholar and a, a beautiful writer, and um, I thought it'd be wonderful if he was sitting on the United States Supreme Court. He was a wonderful, uh, just a wonderful man as well. Became slightly close with him. I know he hired so many local lawyers as his law clerks, and uh, you got to work with him as an associate and then a partner. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, well, not, not technically as a partner. I was <laughs> <yet>. his associate, <laughs> yeah. and certainly would not ever claim to be in his league. Right. But Ed yeah. had a fantastic career. His, his father was a waiter at the old Cantless restaurant, so I understand that oh. at family gatherings, they insisted on having starch tablecloths. Oh, okay. So we're going to go into a, a little break right now, but very quickly, uh, and wrapping it up on uh, Justice Nakamura, he also was a World War II veteran. Yes, he served in the artillery. In the artillery in Europe. So, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, and we'll be uh, right back as soon as... Uh, the break is over. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii, Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Welcome back. And uh, we're here with uh, Mr. Lowell Chun Hoon. He is our guest on Hawaii's Living Legend Lawyers this afternoon. Uh, we did a quick flyover of Mr. Chun Hoon's uh, legal career. I wanted to talk to him in the remaining time about some of the other things he's involved with uh, that pertain to his fight for civil rights and 
uh, civil justice. Uh, so, Mr. Chun Hoon, I would like to ask you, uh, there are several things that you're involved with, and I can only touch on a few of them. But first of all, I'd like to talk about, you, you discussed with me the immigration law clinic that uh, you are hoping to get off the ground and running. Can you talk about that? Sure. This, this is something in which I'm very grateful for your support as the uh, president of the Hawaii Bar uh, Association. But I'm a, a, attempting to create a permanent tenure track position for a professor who will specialize in immigration law. And this professor will also run an immigration law clinic and make it permanent. We currently have an immigration law clinic uh, on a slightly sporadic basis that's run by Bowman Chin and John Egan. But we would like to make this permanent. And in, in order to do that, um, we need to attempt to secure permanent funding from the legislature. Uh, and. You know, for myself, one of the reasons why I'm interested in doing it is, well, I think obviously immigration policy is a matter of mm -hmm. national and international concern. But on a personal level, I think for many of us, uh, you know, I immigration is our family history. And for myself, um, when the Aloon Farms workers encountered their difficulties in Hawaii, I, I thought of this in terms of my own grandfather and the difficulties he must have faced uh, immigrating from China. And so to me, um, you know, it's a matter of creating a resource that can help these uh, different populations and to continue to renew our society with the vigor and energy that uh, immigrants bring. There's another organization called uh, Justice for Our Neighbors as a national organization. And I believe there's uh, a clinic called the Legal Clinic or the Methodist Legal Clinic. You're involved with that as well. That, yeah. that, that's right. That, you know, although I'm also involved with the Legal Aid Society of Hawaii and a group called uh, Hawaii Immigrant Justice Center, the Legal Aid Charter prohibits um, legal aid from generally representing undocumented workers, although there are exceptions for people who are victims of crime. So the Methodist Legal Clinic is an attempt to create another organization that will serve largely the needs of undocumented individuals in our community. And this, this effort is being spearheaded by a number of people who for many years have been involved in um, seeking to develop more public interest resources for immigrants. Uh, some of those who have contributed either currently or in the past are Pat McManaman, Amy Agbayani, Esther Arinaga, and we have a vigorous um, new president, Reverend Amy Wake, who is affiliated with the Methodist Church. So you're involved with the, um, the legal clinic as well as the Hawaii Immigrant Justice Center? Well, you know, we're just yeah. petitioning for our 501c3 status now with the legal clinic. We've attempted to raise money. We're renovating an office that's across the street from Thomas Square where the Methodist Church is. That, that church itself has a high population of Tongans in the congregation and that was somewhat the impetus for starting the project. You know, the um, Hawaii Immigrant Justice Center at one time was Naloyo, no Nakanaka, then became Naloyo, right? So right. you were there from the beginning. You were one of the founders. Right. Well, this, this, this was actually, um, the founder actually was Bill Hosejo, who's now the executive director mm -hmm. of the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission. But Bill led the organization for approximately 10 years, and there are a number of us who helped him create the organization, and then Pat McManaman ran the organization until about 2010 when she was appointed the director of the Department of Human Services and the Abercrombie administration. All right, and um, still going strong. Of course, it seems to be something very timely and contemporary, the, uh, the rights of immigrants right. who are, seem to be under a right. lot of stress at the current yeah. time. After yeah. 2010, the, the private right. nonprofit entity merged with Legal Aid Society of Hawaii, which is why it is now known as the Hawaii Immigrant Justice Center at Legal Aid Society of Hawaii, and is being very ably and energetically led by a young attorney named Tachana Johnson. What about the, um, uh, the proliferation of uh, people coming in from Micronesia and trying to get settled here and assimilate within the population? Do you have any thoughts about how, how the Hawaii Immigrant Justice Center or any other program can, be, can facilitate their assimilation? Well, I, I, I think in actuality, um, 
the Hawaii Immigrant Justice Center is directly involved with help, helping another of uh, Micronesian immigrants with their various problems. I know they hold community workshops to address these legal problems. And my impression is that the work is, a, is of a very substantial grassroots nature. It's very practically oriented, it's very effective, and I think a lot is being done with limited resources. That's always the case, limited resources, right? Getting right. funding, it's like your Hawaii, uh, the Immigration Law Clinic. Are they, you're talking about the uh, University of Hawaii Law School. Correct, yeah. right. yes. So. And, I, and I think the goal is to have the legal clinic educate young lawyers who will then go out and serve things like the Methodist Legal Clinic mm -hmm. and like the Hawaii Immigrant Justice Center, as well as become members of the, of the private immigration bar. The private immigration bar itself is very supportive of all these efforts. And right, and so is the law school. At least some people are. I mean, uh, yes. Professor Calvin Pang, for example, he's always been with you shoulder to shoulder on, the, right. on this aspiration. Yes, and I, th I think Professor Pang will be very instrumental as we attempt to make this clinic a reality. That'd be great. Um, so we're hoping that we can get s at least some seed money to get you going, and then uh, I won't say that you're on your own from that point, but <laughs> you're going to be mostly on your own, and right. hopefully we can find some innovative uh, ways to raise uh, the, the sufficient money to have a continuing tenured position at the law school. That'd be a wonderful thing. And necessary. I mean, most law schools do have, well, not most, but uh, many law schools yes. uh, are enlightened enough to know that that is a significant area in the practice of law. And newly minted lawyers can go out and, and do some very good work in the communities. Yeah. Yeah. And, and because of the high proportion yeah. of immigrants in Hawaii as a whole, we are hoping that once our efforts become better known, that we will find those successful immigrants who recognize the value of a project like this and can help us make it a reality. Great. You know, Lowell, we've been talking about your past history and we had to do a very quick uh, synopsis of that and your aspirations for the future, your involvement in current uh, legal organizations that assist the members of the public. What about just general citizen involvement in democratic institutions? Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I do. I, I, I think this is a time in which, you know, democratic insti institutions are challenged and perhaps even collapsing in the United States. I think the rule of law is in jeopardy. And I think, in general, it behooves citizens to do whatever they can in their private lives and in their communities to resist this, this, this trend. Um, I think also, I might just add, as, as a lawyer, as I've gotten older, more of my work has been in partnership with non-lawyers, so that another organization that I work with extensively is called the Pacific Survivor Center. We do medical care for human trafficking victims. We took care of the Aloon Farms workers. We've created an animation warning middle school and teenage girls about the dangers of sex trafficking. And this animation is now starting to be shown in the schools, and we're hoping to develop greater collaboration with the Department of Education and, and other schools that are interested in hearing about this program. We've been fortunate to be supported in creating the animation by the Junior League, and our curriculum has been supported by the Ching Foundation. Most recently, we, we also are attempting to create something called the Human Rights Provider Network, which is an attempt to create a network of medical subspecialists who will assist our primary uh, physician, Dr. Nicole Littenberg, in treating this population and developing a body of expertise on the treatment of trafficked and tortured people in Hawaii. And I'm happy to say that uh, we've secured a $51,000 or $56,000 grant in aid from the legislature this, this past session with the assistance of Speaker Psyche, representative mm -hmm. um, Lowenberg, who superintends that program, and the assistance of other senators, such as Senator Ihara, who is one of our supporters. Terrific. So if someone is watching in on this program and uh, either is an attorney or a lay person, perhaps a student, or someone who is, uh, wants to become involved, uh, how do they go about that? Well, there's a contact number for the Pacific Survivor Center. Uh, and we have a website, and one could contact us through that 
number and people do or they could send us a brief email to our address and we'll try to pair them up with areas of need in our organization so if they googled Pacific Survivor Center Hawaii or something yes. like that they should come up yes uh, which tells me that you probably don't know the number off the top of your head I'm afraid I don't <laughs> which is not surprising uh, Actually, uh, Mr. Chun Hoon and I are uh, of the, uh, although he is considerably younger, um, we graduated from law school, different law schools at the same time, so I know how that goes. <laughs> I identify with that. Um, you know, any last words, anything you would like the viewers to hear about the current state of affairs in Hawaii primarily, but also nationally, and your aspirations to have this be a better a better state, a better country, and a, perhaps a better world. I know as we get older, we tend to look back as well as look forward, and we tend to realize that we're not going to be here in the saddle forever. Uh, any thoughts about that? I'm putting you on the spot. Well, I, 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 I do have one thought that I'll express about that. As, as I get older, you know, I do worry simply about the absence of hope in our society. There seems to be so much despair. I mean, it's, it's, it, it'll almost give you a clinical depression to watch the news of parents being separated from their children at the border who are merely seeking asylum status. Although I do understand listening to the radio today that President Trump may have reversed that. But I, but I think the antidote to all of that is for each of us in our individual lives to do what we can that is within our grasp. And that's the whole purpose of what I try to do. I find it very rewarding. And I find that if, if you look for them, there are many people in Hawaii who are interested in doing this. And I, and I think there is a joy to linking these people together to try to accomplish something to resist these negative trends. Well said. You know, I, uh, as you were speaking, I, the words just, for some reason, into my mind popped a uh, little phrase from a um, pho photographic exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art, and it was, I hope I'm not misquoting, uh, for mercy has a human heart and pity a human face. I mean, we're all in this uh, same boat on this planet. Um, we have limited time on Earth, and hopefully... I don't know if it's going to happen within our lifetimes, but perhaps uh, we can find something in common that will bring us all together and move forward for the common good of, hu of humankind. That's, that's very true. We yeah. can't all be a great trial lawyer like Howard Luke, but I think each in our own way we have a contribution to make. But we all certainly can make the contribution as Mr. Chun Hoon has done his entire career. He has a lifetime of service to our community, both in Hawaii and to the nation. I want to thank you for being here today. I, I think our time is just about up. I could go on. Now I'm just getting warmed up. I taxied along the runway. I'm now ready to take off, but our time is about up. So I'd like to thank you very much, Mr. Chun Hoon, for being here uh, this afternoon and, and for your very wise words and the uh, obvious compassion you have for your fellow human being. Thank you. Yeah.